So this will, uh, this will be um, necessarily somewhat of an academic talk. So I apologize in advance for the, the many of you who probably are not academics. Uh, I hope it will not be too dry. It's an academic talk because I am an academic. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, and specifically, uh, the the leader of the uh, decentralized and distributed lab at uh, EPFL, um, uh, and uh, this this talk will focus on the fundamentals of distributed randomness from the research perspective. Uh, where did where did these protocols come from? Uh, what's the state of the art uh, from the research uh, side uh, uh, that led to uh, uh, led to the DRAN protocol? Uh, and I'm I'm very glad that uh, 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 that uh, uh, since um, uh, our lab uh, has been involved in in this area, working on uh, on these kind of protocols for a while, I'm extremely glad that uh, uh, distributed randomness has has finally reached deployment, uh, full uh, usable deployment as a as an internet utility. And so I I hope to. Uh, in this talk, uh, give a little bit more in-depth uh, detail, both historical and technical, about uh, um, where DRAN came from and uh, what the, what principles it's based on and and what led to it. Um, so first, before I get more into that, I, I want to uh, introduce my lab, uh, the DDIS lab, just briefly. Um, and, and the main, uh, what, what the DDoS lab is all about is, uh, what, what motivates us is what we call the weakest link security problem. The, the problem that practically all of today's information systems use what we call weakest link security, where you, you only need to break one, one weak link, uh, compromise one server or entity to bring you know, the whole thing crashing down in terms of both integrity, privacy, confidentiality, and other properties. And as our co whole computing si ecosystem gets bigger and more complex, the, we get more data, more interconnected systems, as it should be already clear to everyone for years now that uh, the more, more complexity makes this weakest link security uh, much worse. And that's just because the more weak links they are, the longer the chains we have, the more weak, weak links there are, and the higher probability that any one of them is going to break. Now, for decades, we've known about technologies, approaches, at least in the research world, that can turn, in principle, turn this around to, uh, to turn weakest link security into strongest link security. Um, uh, uh, where, where an attacker would have to break multiple systems or compromise multiple people or credentials or company, uh, companies in a federation in order to compromise security. Um, and in principle, you know, we, we even know that this uh, strongest link security, decentralized security, can even scale to not, not just two or three or four nodes, but, uh, but hundreds or thousands of nodes. And, and it can, you know, when it's done right, um, we, can, uh, we can make security scale the right way so that, so that our systems get, uh, get stronger with, uh, as they become larger rather than weaker, right? So that's, the, um, that's why the DDoS lab exists, to try to figure out how to, how to build protocols that do this and make them practical. Here's a brief uh, introduction to some of the uh, team members that have made this happen. Uh, these are only the current team members. Uh, there is, of course, some past DDoS team members, including, um, incl including Nicola, Nicola Gai, who is now at Proto Protocol Labs and is a, a very central part of the DRAN project. Um, but uh, so that's a quick introduction to DDoS. Let, let's um, move on to um, distributed randomness. First of all, what is public randomness? Why do we need it? Um, Carla already uh, mentioned a few scenarios in which it's extremely important. Uh, lotteries, obviously, but um, lotteries are not, not used just for financial rewards. Uh, they're, they're used for many, uh, many other societal purposes. They, they have been used, uh, they're, they're used for selecting juries uh, from, a, from eligible, um, an eligible population. They've been used in war drafts. Uh, and that's a, a particularly interesting example because it's also an example in which the randomness has been known to go wrong. They, they discovered long after the Vietnam War that the, 
the randomness that was used to choose soldiers to go to their deaths in Vietnam was biased. So some birthdays were better to have than others uh, in terms of uh, getting drafted uh, or in terms of not getting drafted. Uh, much more recently, there's been lots of other uh, situations where uh, randomness either electronically or in, in the classic ph physical world has been hacked or compromised in different ways. So, so, so uh, randomness is, you know, it, it is both extremely important and, uh, and also not, uh, not trivial to, to do securely. Let's look at a few of the uses of electronic randomness specifically in, in distributed protocols. Um, so obviously, you know, lotteries and, and similar things exist in the electronic world, in the, in the decentralized blockchain world, just as much as in the uh, historically in the physical world. But beyond that, uh, randomness is, uh, is used uh, for sampling, uh, for uh, picking, picking representative groups, for example, uh, picking a, a representative, representative set of ballots to audit an election. Um, uh, it's used for rep picking representative quorums for a large pool. This is used in, uh, in uh, leader election systems like, uh, like uh, Protocol Labs is, is using, which they'll, they'll talk about later. It's used in, uh, in uh, large scale sharding protocols uh, such as Am Omni Ledger, which I'll mention in a minute. Um, and in general, it's, uh, it's often used as a very fundamental scalability tool. It's also used in proof of stake blockchains and, and for other purposes. Um, I won't focus on these, uh, talking about these applications very much since uh, 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 a number of other talks you'll hear later will we'll talk much more about uh, applications. I will just mention um, one of the particular applications that came uh, out of our lab, uh, uh, OmniLedger, which, uh, which was one of the first uh, secure uh, uh, horizontally scalable uh, blockchain uh, systems using sh uh, using sharding and um, basically uh, you know what OmniLedger does is to um, is to divide the state of a blockchain into uh, into any number of shards any uh, by by uh, dividing the the total population of validators or miners uh, into smaller uh, but randomly chosen subgroups, and it's it's extremely critical for a uh, from a security perspective that these subgroups be unbiasedly random to ensure that no attacker can uh, can compromise a majority or or get too many um, uh, members of any single shard, which would uh, which would defeat the security, right? Uh, in uh, and so I, again, I won't get into uh, the details here, but but we showed uh, as a as a research project that uh, that this is one of the approaches that can uh, that can get make blockchains extremely scalable and uh, and uh, get essentially as much bandwidth as you uh, transaction processing bandwidth as you as you need. Um, this research project is now a couple years old, uh, and uh, uh, quite a number of, uh, uh, of actual um, blockchains in, dis in deployment are starting to uh, use these, uh, 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 these and similar sharding approaches. Um, and so I'm very happy to see that development. But, uh, uh, but again, this is just one of many applications of, uh, of public randomness. Um, now let's look a little bit more closely at what can go wrong uh, uh, when the randomness is not as random or not as unbiased as, as we really need. So, um, of course, many things uh, can go wrong with randomness. Now, there's uh, unfortunately a very basic confusion that is very common is to mix up public randomness with private randomness. How uh, many of you have probably heard of, uh, uh, of um, uh, com people and companies accidentally posting private keys, uh, in private encryption keys, uh, or pri private signing keys on the internet, or up, uh, or embedding a private key in a in a GitHub repository uh, that goes public. Now that's an example of private random uh, of randomness that should be private, that's intended to be uh, being private, getting leaked to to the public uh, to cause a disastrous uh, security failure. On the other hand, uh, um, public randomness, of course, is randomness that's supposed to be public. Everybody is supposed to know the outcome, 
um, of a lottery or a uh, or, or you know uh, uh, many of the other applications I've been talking about. Uh, but you just want to know that the, the randomness is trustworthy. Um, and it's important uh, to understand that you can't just use private randomness and, and reveal it because, um, because then you will have to completely trust the one party that, uh, or the one device that generated that randomness. And, uh, and a vast amount of experience has shown that just trusting one, de one device or one party to generate public randomness is a terrible idea and, and will go wrong uh, uh, in, in one way or another sooner, sooner or later. Now, another important aspect of randomness that uh, um, is the, uh, the mathematical quality or, or entropy uh, of the randomness. How much, uh, how unpredictable uh, is it from a statistical or mathematical uh, perspective? Uh, and a lot of, this is where um, uh, hardware random num number generators, especially, uh, uh, especially systems that are uh, designed to use, uh, use quantum effects or other very sophisticated um, uh, hardware to, to generate randomness, the, these are usually, um, the purpose of these is, is generally to ensure uh, the high quality and, and uh, high entropy of the randomness. Now, this is, a, this is a very important thing too, but it's different. It's a different problem from the trustworthiness. So you might claim to have the best randomness, the best high entropy randomness in the world, but can everybody trust you to, uh, uh, you know, who can trust you with that claim? Do they need to just trust you on that or can they verify? Um, and, and so that's, uh, so, so um, the quality of, of the purported randomness versus the trustworthiness of the public randomness are, are two very different things, both important. But of course, in this talk, we will try, uh, we will, um, uh, be concerned more with the trustworthiness aspect. Now, finally, um, we have to understand that even if the randomness is truly trustworthy and truly random, truly unpredictable, nevertheless, there's still a question, is it truly unbiased? Is it uniform? Or is it, is it coming out of uh, uh, a random, uh, you know, a random source in a way that's non-uniform in some way that, that some, someone might know? And this, uh, this can also, you know, even if it has quite a bit of good randomness, but it's biased, um, uh, it's, it's again untrustworthy. And, and even, even a tiny bit of bias can compromise many security, many security critical applications of, uh, of public, uh, public randomness. So, uh, so uh, you have to understand that even, you know, even when it seems like randomness sounds good, it sounds like it's eh, mostly not, uh, not unbiased, but that's uh, uh, um, just a little bias is for many applications, not good enough. Um, and and uh, we'll, we'll see later a little bit about why. Now let's let's take a brief look at, at the academic background. Now there's a lot of different approaches known to uh, to create public randomness uh, in the research literature and and in the practice. Um, this talk is is talking about distributed focusing on distributed randomness protocols, uh, and there there's a lot of pre precedent in this case. For example, I recommend uh, as one of the er much earlier papers about 20 years ago, uh, Christian Cachan's paper called "Random Oracles in Constantinople," um, uh, uh, in which uh, which was one of the first papers that used distributed randomness uh, of a kind similar to what we're uh, talking about here. Uh, in a uh, distributed consensus protocol. So it's very uh, relevant background reading for, for blockchain and uh, 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 um, uh, researchers and practitioners interested in, in these kinds of applications. Of course, there's many, um, many other ways to, to generate random numbers, such as slow hashes or verifiable delay functions, which, uh, which will be another topic later, uh, uh, later in, this, uh, uh, in this event. Uh, you can also take an existing blockchain and watch it and get uh, arguably good, arguably somewhat bias-resistant randomness. 
The problem is always that um, when you use, for example, an existing proof of work blockchain, there's always a, at least a little, there's always some opportunity to, for someone to bias the randomness, namely the miners, for example, by throwing away blocks, uh, by mining blocks, but then deciding not to reveal them. And so, uh, you know, anytime there's a, a miner has a choice to reveal or not, that is a, well, potentially expensive way to uh, opportunity to bias randomness, right? Um, now, it might be expensive enough that you don't care, that, that you say, well, that's good enough, that's unbiased, uh, unbiasable enough. And there are very good um, ways, for example, Joe Bono, who is going to speak later, um, and his colleagues have done some very nice analysis of how expensive it needs to be to bias, uh, uh, to bias the randomness that you can derive from a blockchain, or from a proof of work blockchain. Um, and so, uh, so uh, this and other um, known methods of generating randomness are, are, um, are you know, some of the many approaches. Now, uh, what DRAN does, uh, and what I'm going to focus on uh, in the rest of this talk, is, is working in what we call the threshold model, the, the T of N threshold model where you assume that somehow you have some number of nodes, N nodes, um, maintained by separate parties, and you make a security assumption that, uh, that fewer than T of them, fewer than the threshold T of them will be colluding uh, uh, to, to bias the randomness. Now, as long as uh, the, sys the actual system meets this threshold and fewer than T of them uh, are, are corrupt and, and colluding together, uh, the system will be secure. If, uh, if uh, T uh, nodes do, collode, uh, do collude, unfortunately, security can, uh, can immediately fall apart and that, uh, that, that colluding uh, majority can, uh, can defeat the security, right? So, um, so this is one of many possible threat models. It's a very practical one. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, in general, it's hard to avoid threshold assumptions. Uh, other, other blockchain systems that often claim not to use threshold ass assumptions often do actually have a threshold assumption built in if you, uh, if you pull it apart a little bit more carefully. Um, so um, uh, so this, is, this is a very basic, um, uh, and practical model, but of course it does have, a, have its limitations that we need to, we need to acknowledge. Um, so with that, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about ways we might, uh, you know, uh, how, how might we choose random numbers? Let's, and to start with, let's think of a very naive uh, protocol that you'll probably immediately see does not work, right? Let's just say we want a distributed randomness protocol that collect in which there are n nodes and each of them, we want each of the nodes to contribute some to the randomness. And we're gonna combine, have all of them broadcast, uh, pick, a, pick a value that they think is random and uh, they're gonna broadcast that value to all of the other nodes. And then they're all gonna combine each other, uh, uh, you know, collect each other's values and combine them using some mathematical function uh, to decide the final output. Let's say the, this, we just use a simple add, ad, addition function. Um, and uh, if, uh, and in this case, if all of the nodes are trustworthy, uh, this actually produces uh, perfectly good randomness. Even if only one of the nodes um, actually has a good high quality source of, ra uh, of random numbers and, and all, uh, uh, you know, if, if only one node actually is, is producing good random numbers and all the others actually have broken, uh, but innocently broken, uh, not, not maliciously broken random number generators, like, you know, all the others are just outputting a constant all the time, then this will, this will provide good randomness, right? On the other hand, uh, Unfortunately, this is completely insecure as, as soon as any one node, let's call it J, uh, uh, is actually malicious in a dynamic sense, in a distributed system sense. And this is because in distributed systems in general are actually asynchronous. Somebody who, who's malicious generally has the choice to just 
for example, wait a little longer than all the other nodes. Collect, wait to see the output of the other honest nodes before J decides on its own output, right? And so if J just waits to collect all the, all the uh, values of the other nodes uh, uh, that uh, other than J, then J can just decide what it wants the output to be. It's gonna decide on, a v, on an output V and then subtract the, uh, from that the outputs of all the other nodes and then set, uh, set the result to its VJ, right? So, so J can just kind of reverse engineer from what it knows exactly what it needs its output to be in order to completely rig uh, the, the final output that anybody provides, right? So this is pretty terrible as a randomness protocol, as, as should be obvious, right? Now, you know, the, the first thing we might think of doing to this is, well, use, use a smarter combination function. Who would use addition, you know? Why not a cryptographic hash, for example? Well, unfortunately, that only helps a, a little bit. So it, uh, it, it, will, it will ensure that the output is not completely determinable by the, uh, by the dishonest, uh, dishonest node J. But on the other hand, uh, hashes are still pretty quick and easy to, uh, to compute. And so once J has all the other, all the contributions of all the other nodes, it can basically act like a Bitcoin miner. It can, it can uh, launch a whole bunch of uh, um, hash operations in parallel with different possible um, value, uh, different possibilities for its own value and basically mine through millions or billions or more depend just depending on its hardware uh, uh, available and um, and resources and just mine for the choice it likes best and this is a, and this create you know can very easily create uh, a huge uh, bias risk to, uh, that you know so so if you uh, consider a lottery among the you know actual millions of people playing a lottery a one in millions or billions uh, of um, uh, uh, bias risk is, you know, will completely compromise the lottery. You can just win the lottery if you can mine for a one in a million or one in a billion, um, you know, the, the best of one in a one in a million or billion uh, choice, right? So, uh, so using cryptographic hashes or any simple function here does not solve this problem. So let's make, let's make this protocol better, um, at least less naive. So th this brings us to what I call straw man one. And this is actually used, uh, unfortunately it's used surprisingly often in the actual world uh, by, uh, by uh, people and groups who I, I think are not sufficiently aware of the, of the bias problem, right? So, um, so straw man one is is less obviously broken, and that is uh, and, and here we have a two stage protocol where first every node has to pick a random secret, keep it secret for now, don't broadcast it yet, but instead just broadcast a commit to that secret secret. Any cryptographic commit will work, such as a hash, uh, a hash of the secret. Uh, that's the easy obvious way. And so everybody uh, first uh, waits to collect everybody else's commits. And then as a second stage, everyone then broadcasts their secrets, right? Now everyone, and, and then everybody collects those secrets, checks that they match the actual uh, commits that were sent earlier. And assuming everything went uh, went correctly, all the all the secrets actually do match the hash hashes that were sent earlier. Um, everyone can can say, okay, looks good. We're going to use addition or another hash or any function you want uh, to combine the secrets into a final output, right? Now, so the, so let's first talk about when this protocol will work. So this protocol will work if all of the nodes show up, right? So if all of the nodes, if none of the nodes become unavailable or disappear during this process, then this protocol actually will work and generate good randomness, right? Uh, because no node will, no node will know the final output uh, before, um, before the second stage. Um, 
And as long as one of the, uh, at least one of the nodes is honest uh, and is not revealing its, uh, its secret to the other nodes before, or to the adversary before the second stage, then, then that honest node will ensure that, uh, that the output is, uh, is unpredictable and unbiased, right? Assuming nobody, uh, nobody abdicates and you know, drops off between the first and second stage. But that's the big issue, right? So if some, what if somebody doesn't show up in the second stage and reveal the secret that corresponded to the, to the commit they broadcast in the first, first stage, right? So now, uh, you know, well, wh what can we do? Well, one thing we can do is just call that, call that a unsuccessful one of the pro run of the protocol. Well, the protocol fails to, fails to run. We go, um, we call, we go back and try again. Well, we could do that. The problem is that's both a denial of service attack and a major bias attack, right? Anybody, any, uh, any member who doesn't like the output the, uh, that they see, right? You can still have an adversary that um, uh, a malicious node J that just waits, to, uh, waits for all the uh, good nodes uh, to reveal uh, their secrets in the second stage. And then decide, and then the adversary gets to compute what the output will be, since since only J knows what its uh, contribution will be, right? And J decides, well, do I like it or not? Do do I like the outcome? Is it good for me or is it less good for me? And and if he doesn't like it, he's just going to drop off and force everybody else to restart from scratch, right? Now. Uh, it of course get wor gets worse if uh, if an adversary controls some number of colluding nodes because the adversary can then uh, just pick any one of those nodes to drop off, force all of the others to um, uh, to uh, restart the protocol, and then next time around if the uh, in the next round if the adversary still doesn't like uh, uh, the result. Uh, he can he can sacrifice another node, uh, have another node drop off uh, to uh, to um, uh, you know uh, make the protocol fail and have to start over again, right? And so this uh, this uh, by in this way, uh, a colluding adversary can keep the protocol offline for quite a few rounds. Uh, you know the number of rounds that. Um, uh, that the adversary has uh, colluding nodes at, le at the very least. So it's a major de denial of service attack. Um, and it's a significant bias opportunity. Now, of course, the other thing we could do in such a protocol is just to say, well, we're going to go ahead. If somebody drops off in phase two, we're, we're going to go ahead anyway. Um, and we're going to compute something. Uh, ba just based on the outputs that did the, the, the outputs of the nodes that did reveal their secrets, right? The problem with that is, since you don't have the outputs of the nodes that didn't reveal their secrets, you have to uh, you have to change the set of secrets that gets uh, that gets combined based on that set of nodes that you know this the particular set of nodes that did or didn't reveal their secrets. Now, if you think about it, if there is an adversary that has some number of colluding nodes that wants to bias the, the outcome, say F, uh, you know, uh, uh, malicious, uh, maliciously fail, uh, failing nodes, um, those F nodes can, um, can wait until all the honest nodes reveal their secrets. The colluding nodes can now um, it can now compute, you know, using the honest uh, secret values and all of the secret values that they committed to, which they know because they're colluding, um, and they can again do a, basically a mining attack. They can compute in advance the two to the F, the exponential number of possible outcomes they would get for any particular combination of uh, of decisions of, uh, of each of those F nodes keeping, uh, staying in the protocol, carrying it through, and revealing their secret or not, you know, or dropping out, right? So this uh, creates, a, again, an, ex an exponential bias opportunity. Two to the F, uh, the attacker gets to choose the best of two to the F possible outcomes. Uh, uh, and if F is a significant number, if this is, uh, if this is a fairly large federation, for example, um, 
then the attack opportunity, the bias opportunity gets, uh, gets exponentially worse as the, as the system grows. And this is precisely the kind of weakest link security uh, that we're trying to avoid in, in good uh, secure decentralization protocols. Okay, so how do we actually solve this? To, to understand how, uh, what, the, uh, what the real solution to this uh, kind of pro uh, protocol is, we have to run, understand a, a basic um, um, cryptographic technique called sh Shamir secret sharing. And I'm not going to, um, I, I'm not going to talk about it in detail, but just give a very high level overview of uh, the basic idea for those who might not have encountered it before. Now, Shamir secret sharing is a foundation for a lot of threshold crypt cryptography, threshold encryption, threshold signing, multi-party uh, com multi uh, computation of all kinds. Uh, and it's a very uh, old, well, well understood uh, concept. It's a little bit more, uh, less mature, less well known in the blockchain world, but it's, it's, getting, uh, it's getting much more of a, uh, of a toehold gradually. So, and the basic idea of Shamir sharing is, um, is let's assume somebody, let's call him a dealer, wants to deal a secret, wants to create a secret, but then share it among, uh, with a threshold of T among N parties, right? T is less than or equal to N. So, so that any, uh, any threshold T of the parties can cooperate to recover or use it in some way but any less than T parties can't do anything with it and, and get no information about it other than by correctly following the cooperative protocol they're supposed to, right? Now let's see how this, uh, how this can actually work in a super simple scenario. Uh, and I, I like uh, to illustrate this, I like to use uh, a pirate analogy. Suppose you're a pirate uh, and you have um, yeah, a pirate captain and you have found and buried some, uh, some treasure on a, on a desert island and you wanna go back and get it later, right? But you're a lazy pirate and so you don't want to have to go back yourself to get it. Instead, you wanna send uh, some of your henchmen. Now you don't trust, uh, you have three henchmen and you don't trust any one of them completely. So you don't want just one of them to be able to go back and steal it from you. On the other hand, you know that one of the henchmen might disappear, might die, might you know, get killed in a bar fight or whatever, right? So you don't want uh, to require all three henchmen to, um, to go back for it uh, either. Otherwise you might lose it entirely. You'd lose availability of your treasure, right? So to, to balance that, you want to ensure, you want a protocol that ensures that any two of your henchmen will be able to go back and get it for you, but one henchman will not, will not be able to find it. Okay, so how do we do this? So take your map, take your treasure map, find some, uh, find some landmarks on it, and, and you draw a line between those uh, landmarks that goes right through um, uh, where, where the treasure is right on that line, okay? So it can be pretty much any line. But then now you're going to find some more landmarks that, uh, that allow you to, to draw three roughly parallel lines somewhere else on the map. Now you're going to draw yet another line that goes, that intersects all of the lines you drew so far and, uh, and your secret. Now you're going to, now at the points where this new line intersects the three additional lines that you drew, you're going to mark points and call these the secret shares. Those, those three new positions are gonna be the, the secret shares. Now you're gonna draw a map for each of your three henchmen that include, that gives each of them a way to find only one of those specific points, right? So each, each of your henchmen is gonna be able to find one of these three secret share points perfectly based on the landmarks you provide on their respective maps but they won't, they won't know any of their, uh, their, the other points or your secret initially. On the other hand, now, uh, now, this, now this protocol gives us uh, uh, exactly the properties you need because first of all, consider if any one henchman tries to go back and get your secret. This is what they're gonna see. They're gonna have one of the points, their point, but they're not gonna have any others. And so they can draw any number of, uh, an infinite number of lines through the point they have, and they probably get no information at all as to where your secret is. 
On the other hand, any two um, uh, henchmen that go back together, regardless of which two, it doesn't matter, just any two can, uh, can uh, just draw a line through, can co cooperate to draw a line through their respective points and triangulate exactly where the secret is, right? Now, so this, uh, and this is essentially, um, whoops, uh, essentially exactly what Shamir secret sharing is doing. Of course, in, um, you know, the, there's a lot of uh, details that, uh, that matter in actual implementations, but we don't need to get, get into those details now. Now, an obvious question is, well, does this work with thresholds higher than two? And the answer is yes. So it just takes uh, higher degree polynomials. So if you, uh, instead of just lines, so if you want a threshold of three, uh, you know, you want, it, want three out of four or three out of five henchmen to be able to uh, reconstruct the secret, then you just need a quadratic uh, polynomial. Uh, and you get exactly the same properties. And so for, for any given threshold you might want, there's a polynomial that will let you do that. Now, so let's, uh, let's go back to our uh, straw man distributed randomness protocols and see how this affects the situation. So we already discussed straw man one and why it creates the, why it kind of works but creates this major uh, uh, either denial of service or bias uh, opportunity. Right, and and the reason it uh, it fails is because uh, any single node who might drop out can force everybody either to restart the protocol or to change the set of uh, of uh, commits that uh, of secrets that uh, that you uh, go into the final output. Now, Shamir secret sharing provides a solution to this. Basically, now uh, I'm going to leave out a lot more details here. Um, but uh, 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 in this case, each of uh, the n, uh, n nodes acts as a dealer and deals their own secrets. So we, we don't want to uh, just rely on, any, uh, on one dealer. Instead, everybody's going to be a dealer. But then we have ways to combine these secrets homomorphically. Um, and, uh, uh, and by doing that, um, we get a joint, what we call a joint um, uh, polynomial, and this uh, and this gi gives us, in principle, exactly the properties we want. Now, uh, the good news is this works, and it's uh, and it's secure when it's done right, when it's implemented correctly. And there's various ways to implement it. It ensures that no uh, 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 no sub threshold number of nodes who might drop off um, can stop the protocol from working. And uh, regardless of which subthreshold number of nodes might uh, might drop off, they don't they can't change the outcome. They're, the outcome is fixed based on the commits, regardless of which threshold of nodes actually cooperates, uh, stays on, and cooperates to reveal the secret. Um, now. Um, so, uh, so that's that's the basic uh, uh, the, the basic concept that uh, that you need to understand the way secure distributed randomness protocols work. Now, I'm just going to briefly cover uh, a couple of the more recent um, uh, randomness protocols in this space that uh, that the DDIS lab built. Um, now, uh, uh, and our research focused uh, focused especially on scalability. Uh, uh, because uh, the uh, you know the, the this uh, protocol that I just mentioned the basic protocol works fine but it doesn't scale to large numbers of nodes and we wanted to make sure that that you could really scale randomness protocols to large numbers of nodes and this create and, and this led to the uh, research we did we published a few years ago called scalable bias resistant randomness where we showed uh, uh, a couple protocols, Randhound and Randherd, that achieve, uh, uh, that, uh, that can scale this uh, to large numbers of nodes, thousands of nodes. Now, um, to, to do this, what we had to do is we, we had to solve basically a chicken and egg problem. We knew that we could, we could scale this protocol if we could, use, if we could run Shamir secret sharing among uh, smaller groups of nodes, if we could take the big group of participants and divide them into a number of smaller groups and run uh, Shamir secret sharing among those smaller groups. The problem is the way to do that securely needs those groups, really kind of needs those groups to be chosen randomly. But we didn't have randomness 
uh, public randomness to choose those groups securely because that's what we're trying to create, right? So Randhound and Randherd are, are basically trying to solve this chicken and egg uh, security um, uh, scaling problem, right? And I won't get into the details, but the, but the key, uh, just, uh, just to give you a quick um, notion of the key intuition, Randhound is basically a bootstrap protocol that says, okay, we're gonna assume that somebody would like to initiate a protocol uh, to, to generate randomness. And that we're gonna assume that party really wants to finish the protocol. And if they don't actually finish the protocol, then, well, that's their problem. We're, you know, we're, we're, uh, and they're only gonna get one chance to do this. They're, they're not gonna get to try again if they fail, right? So if they fail, they fail, and you don't get the randomness. Uh, but, you know, we're going to try to uh, assume or use this protocol in a, in a place where they have an incentive to succeed, right? And we observed that if you do that, then the, then the initiator can pick these subgroups so that nobody needs to, uh, nobody needs to trust the output of the randomness if the initiator, pick, no matter how uh, the initiator picks them, there's no, no way the initiator will be able to um, to bias or change the randomness if the uh, if it uh, works correctly, or, you know, if if it uh, successfully finishes. On the other hand, um, of course, the uh, the initiator might just fail to complete the protocol, but you know, we're allowing that to happen. Now, so uh, so this gets us. It turns out this uh, gets us part of the way there. It gets us. Um, uh, uh, scalable randomness that uh, guarantees that an initiator who actually wants the protocol to succeed can can ensure that it will, um, but it doesn't give us a beacon. You know what we want is a beacon that we can know will run on its own at least once it's started without depending on anyone and without anybody being able to stop it. And that's what Randherd does. Rand Rand uh, uh, Randherd uses Randhound as a bootstrap protocol. It doesn't, it doesn't rely on the Randhound generated randomness to do anything but provide setup. So that if, if the setup works, then we know we've got a working beacon and, and then we can know, trust the subsequent output of the beacon. If it doesn't work, then we're gonna use a, a Byzantine fault tolerance style leader election protocol to, to pick someone, someone else uh, who, will try, uh, uh, who will try in their turn to, uh, to initiate the beacon and, and launch it, right? And so basically we showed that, uh, uh, that you know, one, uh, uh, using this combination of uh, bootstrapping techniques, we can scale these types of uh, uh, Shamir secret uh, sharing threshold uh, randomness protocols, we can scale them as, uh, as much as we need to. We can scale them to thousands. If, if we had a bigger, bigger test bed, I'm confident we could have scaled to, uh, scaled to 10,000 or more, right? And this scales uh, orders of magnitude better than, than protocols that, um, that just use Shamir secret sharing, right? Okay, so and so that's that's all I'm going to say, and I'm I know I'm running out of time. Um, uh, that that's basically all I want to say about uh, about this um, uh, research background. Uh, and like I said earlier, there's m a lot of other interesting and important research background in this space as well. I uh, instead uh, want to move right to to DRAN and. Uh, uh, so, uh, what is DRAND? I'm not going to say much about it now, but, uh, but uh, basically DRAND is a protocol that was uh, initially started within the DDIS lab, um, especially under the leadership of Nicolas Gailly, who, who we'll be talking later. later. Uh, and and DRAND basically recognizes that, recognize that we need something much more simple, uh, but uh, um, uh, for for deployability, but uh, at least for now, it doesn't need to DRAN doesn't need to scale to thousands of nodes because uh, because the League of Entropy doesn't yet have thousands of members. Maybe you know, hopefully soon it will, and maybe then we will need the scalability techniques that Randhound and Randherd uh, uh, prototyped. But uh, but until then, for now, we needed some uh, a simpler, more streamlined, more operational. Uh, um, protocol for deployment, and that is what DRAND is. Now, I'm not uh, again. I'm not going to get uh, into the the details of DRAND because I don't want to steal the thunder of the 
uh, of the later speakers. So I will just uh, conclude with the basic uh, takeaway points of this thought uh, talk. Um, uh, threshold public randomness is a very basic, uh, uh, important primitive. To do it right, you need uh, you need something like uh, in this threshold model. You need something like Shamir secret sharing. Um, Randhound uh, Rand and Randherd uh, uh, showed how this uh, how this can can scale uh, as as much as we need it to. But then the League of Entropy is taking over and making it practical and usable as an internet utility now. So thank you very much for your attention.